Explorers discovered Florida's treasure, and we cherished and preserved it for hundreds of years. Until now. It's the death of a thousand cuts. This is a story of water choked in slime, a river sample that tested 10 times too toxic to touch. It's all caused because the federal government didn't do their job. And politicians pointing fingers or asleep at the wheel. They put the blinders on, you know? See no evil. This is a very complex problem uh, with a complex solution. It's heartbreaking. You swing this pendulum too far and you get away from what most people want. We'll explain the threat to our environment, our economy, and our health. We water now. We water now. We'll break down the history, the causes, and our options to head off disaster that now hang in the balance of money, power, and politics. We have a crisis. We see it on Southwest Florida beaches in a rotting stew of dead fish. That's caused by an explosion of a microorganism called K. brevis. I'm just completely shocked at the loss of life here. And we see it in the Clusahatchee River and Lake Okeechobee in a brew of green slime. That's caused by an infestation of cyanobacteria. Both kill marine life. Both can make people sick. It's overwhelming. I mean, as soon as you get out of the car, you start coughing and, you know, it's just your chest hurts. K. brevis can cause breathing problems when the toxin drifts in the air. A lot of dead fish, a lot of dark water, a lot of people coughing. And cyanobacteria emits a neurotoxin scientists have associated with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Lou Gehrig's disease. Long-term risks of these toxic algae, the most common one that um, actually has been studied um, and the research came out about two years ago is end-stage liver disease. Um, and that's um, actually deadly. Both cyanobacteria in freshwater and K. brevis in saltwater feed off of nutrients from manure and chemical fertilizer. That is a big part of our problem. Our state has a combination of leaking septic tanks and fertilizer seeping into our water supply from people's lawns and from dairy farms and from sugar farms, which brings us now to the mess in Lake Okeechobee. Algae blooms um, are usually caused by excessive nutrients. Here's what happened. Lake Okeechobee naturally flowed south into the Everglades, but last century our government built a dike around it to prevent flooding for people who move near the lake. That redirects the lake flow east into the Atlantic and west into the Gulf. Towns and sugar farms filled in the south, and Lake Okeechobee got polluted with fertilizer and pesticide because of runoff from towns and residential development and from dairy farms to the north and to a large extent from the sugar fields to the south. Now you may be thinking, wait a minute, those sugar fields are south of the lake. Wouldn't the runoff go south away from the lake? Well, yes, it would, except the sugar farmers used to back pump into the lake and the state continued to back pump polluted water north into the lake again to prevent flooding. As long as we have to release, release water, then we're gonna have this pollution problem in sunlight and in heat, those nutrients cook up thick batches of cyanobacteria, which produce the toxic green sludge in fresh water, and it can feed the K. brevis organisms in salt water that cause the red tide fish kills. Scientists can't directly tie the flow of pollution from the lake to red tide because red tide naturally occurs, but they say it could be making it more intense. I'm angry. I'm so we moved here for a reason. People come here for a reason. Homeowners and boaters and businesses that depend on tourism are livid. It's going to be crippling to our economy when there's so many businesses that depend on the clean water that we have here. We know we've had this crisis for decades, and in the 1980s, former Governor Bob Graham took the lead in trying to fix it. The history in Florida is that water belongs to the people of Florida. Graham created the state agency to control urban sprawl, and he launched and led the Save Our Everglades campaign to restore the natural flow of Lake Okeechobee through the Everglades. Graham's successors tried to keep it going in different ways, but as legal battles and politics played out, plans sputtered and had a way of going south more than the water. For example, in the 1990s, voters passed an amendment to make polluters pay for cleanup, but the legislature failed to implement it at first and then watered it down. 
In 2000, President Clinton and former Governor Jeb Bush struck a deal called the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. The state and feds agreed to split the cost of cleaning up and restoring the Everglades through a series of water storage projects. But Congress did not live up to its end of the deal. And then Governor Charlie Chris moved on from that and shifted to a much bolder and different plan to restore the ecosystem. I can envision no better gift to the Everglades, the people of Florida, and the people of America as well as our planet than to place in public ownership this missing link that represents the key to true restoration. Chris struck a deal to buy out and shut down 187,000 acres of sugar farms for $1.75 billion. This does it in a way that we can transition out and take care of the employees and the communities. At the same time, the governor's taking care of the Everglades restoration. So I thought it hit the right balance at the right time. You know, $1.75 billion is a large inve investment, but the restoration value that we are buying is much larger. In fact, in fact, it's, it's priceless. But the state later scaled that back, and then Chris ran for Senate instead of seeing it through and left the option to buy much of that land to his successor, Rick Scott. And Governor Scott took a pass. Florida is open for business. Woo! Governor Scott wanted to spur business and development in a bad economy, so he relaxed environmental regulations and state controls on urban sprawl and slashed funding for environmental protection. And then as the economy improved, he ramped up money for the environment. Scott signed a deal to spend $32 million a year on improving the Everglades through water treatment and storage systems. Environmentalists praised him for that, but rip him for the prior cuts and for slashing oversight. What do we want? When do we want it? Now! Coming up, we'll take a closer look at the water crisis, the changes in state policy, and perspective from both sides. A state government faces an environmental nightmare from the Everglades to the coast. It should remember the tourist campaign it launched nearly 40 years ago. When you need it bad, we've got it good. When you need it bad, come to Florida. That campaign worked because people came to Florida for the idea of Florida. It's the rivers, the lakes, the estuaries, the beaches, and natural gems all from coast to coast. That's the core of the state's marketing strategy. And you'll notice Democrats and Republicans have a green streak you will not see as much in other states. They know if they preserve our environment, our state economy will thrive. Republicans bragged of their uh, coastal and environmental protection records, just like Democrats. So to understand the water pollution crisis and the blame game right now in state government, you need to look back at our history of how big development has fed the pollution and how that big development suddenly took off after World War II. Despite weeks and months of house hunting, some three million married couples throughout the country today are still unable to establish homes of their own. We had a national lag in home construction and a baby boom and a game-changing invention. Guess what we've got? An RCA room air conditioner. Yeah, the expansion of modern air conditioning and the creation of an interstate system drove sudden mass migration south to the promise of Florida and the natural gems and higher quality of life. Nearly everyone goes boating. That drove rapid development of shopping centers and cheap subdivisions. And there is a large variety of home sites available. It just kept going. And by the 1980s, that continuous building boom caught up to us in a mess of clogged roads and water issues and pollution. We had a lot of people on board on both sides of the aisle, environmentalists, business owners, and everybody saying, wait a minute, if we don't protect what we have, we're not going to be continuing to attract people to here. Governor Bob Graham created a system to restore the environment and contain the sprawl. He created what we call state growth management through an agency called the Department of Community Affairs. Now, when a new development project was being proposed, you needed to take into account what is the impact on water. It reviewed big building projects to make sure they were needed and did not compromise natural resources. And the next five governors kept it going until the legislature and Governor Rick Scott dismantled it. Scott rode the Tea Party movement in office, which focused on reducing the reach of government. He said the state was reaching too far into local affairs, stifling big development deals that fueled jobs. 
And to that end, Scott and his allies in the legislature dismantled the Department of Community Affairs and state growth management in Florida. How and why did government expand so much and try to control so much economic activity or exercise those powers? The new philosophy was that local governments know what's in the best interest of their communities and that state bureaucrats should not get in the way. Of course, many environmentalists beg to differ. These larger pro projects simply overwhelmed the resources that many of these smaller cities and counties or less populated counties have where they don't have scientists, they don't have hydrogeologists. They will make a decision that they see as, as benefits their jurisdiction, but they don't think about the, what's going to happen in the bordering community. Meanwhile, the state also made it harder for citizens to challenge major building projects by shifting the burden of proof over whether they could harm natural resources. Again, the goal was to jumpstart growth and bring back jobs after the Great Recession. And as more development spread across the state, so has the use of fertilizer. And that's how the decision to dismantle growth management relates to the water crisis. When rain washes that fertilizer into our drainage systems, the nutrients that feed grass also feed the blooms of bacteria that foul up our lakes and rivers. At the same time, aging septic tanks also leak and feed the blooms. The legislature had passed a law requiring septic tank inspections every five years. But in 2012, Governor Scott and the legislature got rid of those inspections to save homeowners from paying for them, which can run five, six hundred dollars. So more than two and a half million tanks across the state are not getting checked for leaks. And while cutting septic tank inspections and dismantling state growth management, the governor also slashed funding for the offices that monitor water quality. Let's go to the heart of the current water crisis in South Florida. Here are the water monitoring sites from 1995 to 2007. The state paid for the ones in blue. Now, here's what's left of the water monitoring network today. Numbers from Florida International University show we went from around 350 monitoring stations down to 115. That was then, this is now. It's harmful for our ability to respond and to say a crisis is coming. Meanwhile, the state's water management districts are directly responsible for protecting water quality and natural resources. And in 2011, Governor Scott bragged of slashing all of their budgets by hundreds of millions of dollars. Also this week, I took action on the proposed budgets of Florida's five water management districts. Altogether, these budgets reflect a reduction of more than $700 million over last year. The governor now says the water district set their own budgets, but he approves or disapproves them, and he signed the law reducing their funds. I want to thank the districts and the Department of Environmental Protection for their hard work as they examine their budgets to find efficiencies and savings. And as all of this was playing out, Governor Scott also cut funding at DEP. That's the agency that polices and cracks down on polluters. And look what happened to the number of crackdowns. Environmentalists at a group called PEER track the number of enforcement cases to show the nosedive under the Scott administration. From opening around 1,500 cases a year under Jeb Bush and Charlie Crist, down to around 250 a year under Governor Scott. Which the Scott administration explains by citing a high compliance rate, suggesting there are not as many bad actors to crack down on. Well, Governor Scott now touts his increases in environmental funding since the economy improved and he blames the pollution crisis on the federal government. Coming up, we'll show you what the feds have done, what they have failed to do, and how local governments have contributed to spoiling Florida's treasures. Environmentalists tie the toxic algae blooms in our fresh water to climate change because the organisms that cause those blooms need nutrients and heat. And as water gets hotter, it creates a better climate for those organisms to grow. So for years, environmentalists have ripped Governor Scott for not taking a position on climate change and dodging our questions about it. Do you believe that human activity is causing our climate to change? So I, I had a very good meeting yesterday. Did you believe the case that the scientists were making on climate change? Well, look, I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in this, so. 
And Scott has also taken heat for his lack of a plan to address the air pollution scientists say is causing our climate to change. Governor, what's your plan for dealing with global climate change? In fact, after the governor reportedly banned his staff from even saying climate change and his top natural disaster manager could not say it in a hearing, lawmakers from both parties laughed in his face. Demanding that states have a climate change plan. In the next iterations of them will require to have uh, language to that effect. What were those words you were using? I used climate change. Future versions of our mitigation plan will be required to have uh, language discussing that issue. What issue is that? Uh, the issue that you mentioned earlier regarding uh, climate. <laughs> so much. Environmentalists also hammer Governor Scott for rolling back environmental regulations and dismantling growth management and cutting back on water monitoring and enforcement, as we have previously explained. But Governor Scott accepts no responsibility for the water pollution crisis. He is passing all of the blame to the federal government. But it's all caused because the federal government didn't do their job. And the federal government has failed Florida in a couple of ways. 18 years ago, for example, the feds agreed to share cost of Everglades cleanup. Then federal money dried up during the George W. Bush administration. The federal government is also responsible for maintaining the dike around Lake Okeechobee, and that has been in disrepair for years. And that means they can't contain as much of the polluted water within Lake Okeechobee. So they have to discharge more of it east and west, fouling up more of the rivers and estuaries so the ailing dike won't fail. Uh, the algae is caused because the federal government has not done their job. The federal government's responsibility is to fix the dike at Lake Okeechobee. That's 100% a federal project. To his credit, Governor Scott pushed for and got a huge financial commitment from the federal government to work on the dike, and that includes more than $500 million this year to speed up repairs. And so by 2022, the dike will be able to hold a lot more water, so hopefully at that point we won't see uh, the algae blooms. Scott's strategy here is to, one, contain pollution within Lake Okeechobee by fixing the dike so it can hold more water, and two, speed up construction of a new deep water reservoir that can hold more water until they can treat it and release it south. Environmentalists support the concept here, though they say the dike should be repaired for flood control, not storing polluted water. He's talking about creating two giant bathtubs in the Everglades. And they want that new deep water reservoir to be wider and not as deep, so it will be less likely to fail as it ages. And how do you control that structure? Prevent it from cracking or releasing like a dam? How do you, they're predicting wave action in that giant reservoir. Well, the governor's right about the dike problems and the lapses from the feds, but clean water advocates like the League of Women Voters say the pollution crisis goes well beyond that. I think all parties have had some culpability, but this is not a situation where you can say, I can pass this buck. And to that point, local governments across the state have also contributed to this mess by not maintaining their sewers. Heavy rain swamped their systems and flush wastewater that's not fully treated into our natural waters, which again feeds the organisms that foul up the water. St. Petersburg is a striking example of a city that neglected its system for decades until it failed in 2015, releasing a flood of wastewater into the bay. But clearly how we got here, and we see this trend across the country where local governments just chronically underfunded uh, uh, replacement and maintenance of our infrastructure. We deferred maintenance, deferred maintenance, deferred maintenance. St. Pete has finally committed to a long-term fix, but many other local governments have not. They have other priorities that they want to spend their money on. So until the crisis comes, they put the blinders on, you know, see no evil. We've shown you how this feeds the toxic bacterial blooms in freshwater. Again, scientists cannot say that this is also causing the red tide outbreaks in salt water because red tide occurs in nature. But scientists also say the pollution we pump into the water can make the red tide worse. We should not ignore the impacts that human activities do have in exacerbating um, the red tide events. And that's how scientists relate fertilizer runoff and leaky septic tanks and wastewater to red tide by controlling um, the inputs of nutrients from human activities, we will get a better handle and ability, I think, on getting our um, ocean ecosystems back into balance uh, before, but you will not get rid of red tide. And yet a political analysis found the state has reduced funding for red tide research. We'll show you why coming up.
A red tide is making people sick and crushing tourism across southwest Florida beaches. Once the red tide hit, you can't get even locals to come across the bridge because the smell and the respiratory things are just so awful. Researchers at Mode Marine Lab are working on ways to fight red tide. For example, this experiment in Boca Grande shows how they can pump water through a system that kills the toxic bacteria and then releases the cleanse water back into the canals. We're studying red tide. We're trying to understand what causes it. I mean, we know it's natural. It's been around for thousands of years, uh, but what can we do about it? That's the big question. And as they try to answer that question, their funding has gone down through the years. A Politico budget analysis showed how state funding for red tide research has gone down by millions of dollars the past 10 years. Well, the state cut funding during the Great Recession and did not restore it to what it was as the economy improved. The Politico analysis showed on average Florida spent nearly $4 million a year under former Governor Christ, and then it dropped to, on average, $2.5 million the last seven years under Governor Rick Scott. Well, Scott's team says funding has been more consistent under his administration and that it's making a greater commitment to red tide now. Well, that would also appear to follow a bit of a pattern. Moat Marine sent us stats through the last 20 years showing how state and federal funding tends to go up after a red tide outbreak and then funding dwindles when red tide clears and fades from the daily news cycle. For a closer look at red tide and salt water and the separate toxic green slime working through our rivers and inland waterways, check out our YouTube channel. Search for Craig Patrick's Money, Power and Politics and click subscribe. And of course, we'll also continue to investigate Florida's water crisis on Fox 13 News. Thank you for watching.